Hi. Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the 23rd Distinguished Lecture Series organized by Faculty of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. My name is Nori Hisham Bakari from School of Civil Engineering, UTM, as your host today. We feel very honored today to have Professor Hong Hao from Curtin University, Perth, Western Australia, as our guest speaker. The topic of his speech is towards the sustainable, resilient, and multi-hazard resistant design of civil infrastructure, which is falls within the discipline of structural engineering. Before we proceed with the talk, I would like to share some updates related to School of Civil Engineering UTM. Recently, School of Civil Engineering UTM has been ranked by QS ranking as the top school of civil engineering in Malaysia in the subject of civil structural for the year 2020. Our school is actively involved in basic and applied research and also provide high quality technical advisory support to local and international industries to various R&D projects and consultancies. I also would like to introduce one of our high impact center of excellence. Under the Faculty of Engineering, we have one of the leading high impact center of, of excellence in the country, which is known as Institute of Noise and Vibration. The institute is recognized as referral center by the industry and government agencies for, no, for noise and vibration and seismic engineering in the country. The institute is mainly involved in research and consult consultancies in the area of structural health monitoring, structural integrity, and seismic engineering. To proceed with the lecture, I would like to pass the session to the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Professor Muhammad Rafiq Abdul Qadir, for welcoming speech and to introduce our speaker today. Over to you, Prof Rafiq. Thank you, Prof Hisham. Assalamualaikum. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, Welcome to our 23rd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Distinguished Professor Hong Hao from Curtin University, Australia. A bit about our presenter today. Hong Hao received his Bachelor of Engineering from Tianjin University Master of Science and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, USA. He is John Curtin Distinguished Professor in Curtin University and Australian Laureate Fellow. He has won over two dozen research, research publications and research supervision awards and has been invited to give more than 80 keynote presentations in international conferences around the globe. His research results are included in textbooks, adopted in design codes, and used in construction <coughs> projects around the world. He is the chief editor of International Journal of Protective Structures, chief editor of International Journal of Life Cycle Performance Engineering, and serves in the editorial boards of another 10 journals. He is the president of the International Association of Protective Structures, Australian Rep in the International Association of Earthquake Engineering, Advisory Board Member of Australian Network on Structural Health Monitoring. He chaired and co-chaired 15 international conferences and served in numerous international conference committees. He has published over 500 international journal papers. His publications have received over 18,000 citations with his index of 70 in Google Scholar. He is one of the most highly cited researchers in civil engineering discipline in the world. He is an elected fellow of Australian Academy of Technological Science and Engineering, Distinguished Fellow of International Association of Protective Structures, Fellow of Engineers Australia, Fellow of American Society of Civil Engineers, and Fellow of the International Association of Engineering Asset Management. So that is a biography of our speaker. Here now is distinguished Professor Hong Hao from Curtin University, Australia, with a talk entitled Towards the Sustainable, Resilient, and Multi-Hazard Resistant Design of Civil Infrastructures. Professor Hong Hao, over to you. Thank you, Professor Rafiq. And before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Rafiq and the <coughs> Associate Professor Park Harry for uh, your invitation and also 
and your arrangement gave me this opportunity to uh, to give this talk. I'm very happy uh, to share with you some uh, of our research, recent and uh, current research results, and also uh, some of my thoughts about uh, the next generation uh, structure uh, designs to in view of this uh, uh, changing uh, world. We're talking about sustainability, talking about resilience. That is uh, the keyword of my uh, presentation uh, today. Um, can, and um, so, and first, I'd like to. It's not moving again. I'm uh, sorry, it's uh, not moving. Okay, I, I use my, I have a three monitors. I use another monitor to control. I first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my research group in Curtin University and also, of course, Australia Research Council for uh, uh, many, many uh, research supports throughout the years. Uh, so um, the talk, of course, I cannot. Uh, I asked uh, Hisham, and I found out, I understand that the audience has uh, a various uh, engineering background. So I'm not going to talk uh, in detail of any particular uh, project. Instead of give a general uh, talk and um, that uh, introduce uh, some of the recent development and also um, as the uh, current uh, research towards development of next generation of civil engineering uh, structures. So um, the challenge and keywords of this talk is sustainable, resilient, and multi-headed resistance. Why are we talking about uh, this are uh, the challenge? Uh, first, if we look at the uh, sustainability, in 2030, uh, UN's uh, sustainable uh, goal, and they are at, altogether, UN put 17 of them. If you uh, look, the uh, sustainable uh, goal 9 and 11, they are directly related to the civil engineering, structural engineering. And if you look into more detail, other uh, goals, for example, 6, 7, 13, et cetera, clean water and sanitation, all those uh, are indirectly related to civil structure engineering because you want clean water, you want uh, clean energy, sanitation, uh, you need civil, proper civil uh, infrastructure. So uh, second, resilient, resilient uh, structure we're talking about now, it's very inward. People talk a lot of resilience. Uh, designs, res resilient structure, resilient community, and the uh, resilient uh, city or uh, region. And but um, most of this uh, uh, talk, when people talk about resilient, resilient designs, they are actually uh, they are actually uh, um, uh, focused on the safety and the quick recovery. Um, but if you look at the uh, look at the uh, definition, and for example, uh, the one uh, by Michel Bruno and my classmates at Berkeley, and his definition of the resilient uh, for earthquake resilient structure, he emphasized on recovery and minimize social disruption. If you look at the other definitions, for example, by Buzz Hollins or Brian Walker, uh, an Australian researcher, uh, they emphasize uh, on the absorb disturbance, it's absorbing the changes. And uh, talk about even Obama, US White House, US uh, White House uh, Obama uh, administration, they put their definition of resilience of the society is to adapt and recover rapidly. And or uh, by uh, uh, Craig Davis, uh, Craig is the uh, current U.S. Uh, the ASCE's 
resilient society chair, and he put on um, the uh, definition, he emphasized uh, recovery, continue providing service. I talked to Craig a few years ago, and exactly what is the resilience when talking about in civil engineering, and the, what is the framework we can uh, uh, put on in the design and analysis, but he said there is a different uh, opinions, and, uh, opinions, different people have put different emphasis. So if we summarize this, resilience could involve absorb, adapt, uh, the change, uh, continue or keep functioning of a structure or a society. And if uh, any damage occurs, and the quick recovery to minimize the disruption. And I add on, uh, because uh, we have many, many uh, aging structures, when we talk about a design, next generation structured design, I add on one thing I, uh, I think is also important is end of service life decommissioning, how we can decommission a structure. So all the put all this, but we still do not have a proper, um, we do not have a, a design or analysis a framework. So if you dig into in more uh, depth, the resilience uh, definition, what exactly it means in, uh, in word, actually it's come from Latin word initially, and become a, in, used in English only in 1620. And initially, it mainly refers to rebound or elasticity, how you can rebound. And so in 19, uh, 1900, it mainly is uh, put, uh, used resilient uh, to dis uh, apply to people. But in year 2000, become a really a in world. Everybody's talking about resilient, how we can do a resilient design. So uh, everything now is resilient and especially for disaster and risk management. So uh, there's my understanding, uh, there is a common confusion with, uh, regarding the resilience is a mixed resistance with resilience. So although resistance will contribute to resilience, it's a very important, but resilience is about recovery from the impact, not uh, the resistance. Resistance is about uh, how strong uh, it is to resist the impact. Give more um, and this uh, analysis what uh, that means. So resilience of a structure uh, come to our civil engineering is measured by how quickly func functionality can be restored. If resistance is exceeded, that means uh, we have some damage, loss of functionality. Uh, and the resistance of the structure actually indicates the capacity of the structure to resist a defined event without loss of functionality. Therefore, if we define the resilience uh, of a structure, uh, resistance will contribute to it, but is not uh, 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 of it yet. The uh, resilient uh, definition involves uh, more, involves more. Give, we give you some example. Um, uh, for example, if we have an 80 year old man, and uh, now it, we can we can say it's a fully resilient to cold weather, uh, but it is less resilient to cold weather. Plus, flu virus means you catch uh, flu and but can recover in a week, but it is not resilient to cold weather and COVID 19, 19 uh, to COVID 19. Uh, if it unfortunately dies. That means uh, it's not resilient at all. Put the uh, sum right, put all of this together, and we know if we want to develop a framework for resilience analysis and design, we should consider the ability to adapt to changes, ability to resist a defined event, and uh, also acceptable period of loss of functionality. So how fast we can recover. And also techniques for effective decommissioning. So this uh, actually will go beyond to engineer. And uh, engineer probably can uh, design the resistance, uh, but uh, how uh, 
what is the acceptable period for loss of functionality, actually we need uh, input of society, policymakers and the government. So it is a lot more complicated than just the resistance. Uh, so now, uh, multi-hazards uh, also, and for a uh, structure during its service life, it has a chance to experience many different types of uh, hazards. Uh, for example, earthquake blast impact, wind wave fire, pollution and fatigue, etc. And my personal research experience uh, or interest is in the earthquake blast and impact. Basically, it's a dynamic loading. If you, um, so I give you those examples. If you uh, examine those damage in more detail, you'll find out they actually uh, have different response modes and the different damage mechanism. And some uh, uh, technology which is uh, effective to um, resist one type of uh, hazard or one type of loading could have uh, adverse effect on other type of loading. I el elaborate a little bit more about this. So we need to consider the safety uh, or resilience of a structure in the design stage often we need to consider multi-hazard. Uh, so the challenge, uh, of course, is uh, a new design concepts to accommodate, uh, to accommodate the, uh, need, uh, the societal needs. And good thing is, if you look at the uh, involvement of uh, the design uh, concept evolves, initially, uh, traditionally, uh, uh, and we have a limit state design, that means we just make uh, the structure uh, a st uh, has a sufficient resistance to uh, uh, design loads, so limit states, or then it came to the reliability-based design, and then performance-based design, now it's quite commonly uh, uh, used, adopted. And so not only the safety, we also consider the performance of the structure uh, subject to a given uh, loading, and also uh, uh, remaining uh, load carrying capacity based design. Uh, so that uh, is not uh, uh, widely followed up, but uh, it's a very, very good uh, technology or method developed uh, by, like, uh, like a performance based design, remaining load carrying capacity based design, uh, all initiated by Professor Jack Maley of UC Berkeley. So they are very, very good. And, but if you look at all of this, uh, they're still uh, basically safety based and or safety or economic based. You do the um, uh, remaining load carrying capacity based design, that means we accept a certain level of damage and uh, uh, ultimately, ultimately, as far as the structure will not collapse, so we can protect life, especially in view of some events, uh, the probability of occurrence is quite low, so we can save some uh, uh, costs. Um, so um, so if you look at all this design uh, uh, methodology or concept, the still is all uh, uh, based on safety. Of course, safety is the most important because safety, because uh, civil engineering structure is different from mechanical engineering or uh, uh, other type of engineering profession or areas. And mechanical engineering damage of, uh, say, a car, a vehicle, or uh, electrical engineering, you have the damage in the mobile phone, and uh, the loss, it could be acceptable, but uh, the collapse of a civil structure uh, could enormous economic loss and also uh, kill people, so the loss of lives. So it, safety is the most uh, critical, it's very, very important. And, and but, for the next generation of uh, uh, design, uh, we beside the safety, we need also to consider sustainability and the resilience uh, of the structure. So, uh, and also need to consider uh, multi hazard uh, for the structure. For that will contribute to the safety, contribute to the resilient resilience of the structure. So that uh, in my uh, in my uh, uh, personal uh, uh, opinion is a civil structure engineer that is what we need to consider what to work on for this uh, next generation uh, of design for civil structures 
So now if we come, come back to uh, say how we can achieve this, how we do that, so talking about the sustainable, it's uh, uh, quite straightforward, it's definition. If we have a supply is larger than the demand, and then it's sustainable. But uh, look at the, the resilient, it's uh, a lot more complicated. And as I, I just mentioned, not only depends on civil structure engineers, and we also need the input from society, we need the input from government policy makers. Uh, but basically we need to consider the ability to adapt to the changes like uh, climate change. Uh, for example, climate change will have an increased uh, wind speed, typhoon speed. And so can we adapt to these changes and also uh, keep functioning if uh, the strength is not sufficient, have a loss, certain period uh, loss of function, but uh, keep in a short period, we ha can have a quick recovery. So uh, it's, it's a slightly more uh, complicated. And, but beside those challenges, we have many uh, opportunities as well. And uh, we have new materials, many new materials being developed. And now it's available and we have a new structure forms and new structure forms uh, that means, and uh, we can, for example, the construction, construction technology nowadays, for example, 3D printing, we can design or build our structure. Uh, with uh, um, uh, forms, uh, it not only aesthetically appealing, but also with the forms which are more effective to resist the loading. Uh, before it's very difficult uh, to do, but with 3D printing, we can do uh, things, a lot of things. And also we have uh, now compute, computer technology, uh, computer science, computer technology, which allow us to have a very detailed analysis uh, prediction as the performance of the structures. And also have new technologies for structure health monitoring and, uh, and engineering and it's, uh, uh, engineering asset management. So uh, that part uh, I'm not uh, talking about, uh, I'm not talking today, but that is also opportunities. Um, so, um, so my uh, research work, basically is a compilation of, uh, I introduced to you, is a compilation of uh, uh, use prefabrication technology with new construction materials, try to uh, achieve sustainability and the resilient uh, objectives. Uh, I briefly introduced to you some uh, of uh, our work. First, prefabrication technology, of course, everybody knows, and uh, it has many, many uh, uh, obvious uh, benefits, uh, advantages. Uh, it make you can, for example, it, uh, everybody knows that prefabrication uh, can speed up the construction. We can have a much better quality control, enhance the site safety, site disruption, and reduce the. Uh, um, uh, so it's a uh, it relatively uh, not controlled by the environment uh, or weathers. If it's a rain, you still can work in the workshop, for example. And so, but besides this, there are many other advantages uh, people might overlook. Uh, for example, uh, prefabrication actually give us opportunity to, to for use some new construction materials, for example, geopolymer concrete, fiber reinforced concrete, those uh, materials uh, it could be difficult to be properly mixed at a construction site. But if you uh, prepare them in a workshop, with uh, very, very well controlled uh, the uh, environment in a workshop, so we can make uh, effective use of those materials. And also facilitate of use new construction technologies, uh, 3D printing, I just mentioned, so we can make the structure uh, more uh, effective to resist the loading. And also uh, we can uh, design a structure, it's easier, relatively easier to design the structure to prevent the progressive collapse. We can put uh, some uh, safety keys uh, uh, when collapse occurs, we'll stop at a certain uh, place 
uh, when it uh, reach the safety keys. And also, we can uh, easily to recycle, remove, and replace the damaged structure. That means we can uh, make it more resilient because we uh, uh, the uh, loss the period of uh, defunctioning uh, uh, loss of function will be uh, minimized. So make the structure resilient and also it's easier to dismantle it uh, for uh, the structure at its end of service life. So it have many of those advantages. And for uh, to using the material that is one of the project uh, we just uh, uh, finished. Uh, I'm still going on on the structure, but for materials, we use a geopolymer concrete to replace Portland concrete. And we know we make uh, uh, cement, Portland cement, it will uh, generate a lot of carbon dioxide into the air uh, because the cement is produced at a very high temperature. And now some stati statistics said the uh, carbon dioxide in the uh, in air, actually, in the world, uh, uh, it consists of about eight uh, percent emission, which from the production of the cement. And so, and what what does it mean is that, for for example, in uh, uh, year twenty sixteen, the cement production generated about two point two billion tons of CO two. It's about eight uh, percent global total. And uh, of course. If you uh, uh, break it down, uh, China uh, generates the most. That's why China has a very big uh, pollution problem because a lot of construction activities there, and 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 then uh, besides uh, uh, this, uh, you generate cement. But on the other side, on the other side, the that is a, a cons consumption of coals around the world, and. Also, uh, China uh, consumed uh, about half of the coal in, in in the world, and uh, if you, uh, they consume uh, the the coal, you generate the fly ash, generate the fly ash, and this uh, fly ash, of course, uh, you, uh, you need to find uh, a place to dispose of them if you don't use them, and then will occupy a lot of land. Um, so those are the statistics uh, around the world, the fly ash being reused, or the total fly ash generated from uh, burning the coal, from uh, coal burning. So uh, that means uh, you, you, you can uh, see a, a lot of fly ash is uh, not being reused. Those industry byproducts. Uh, so what we're thinking is make the construction sustainable of course, not the way I think many, many people are thinking is make construction sustainable. We can make use those fly ashes to create concrete or construction materials. That is the ge uh, geopolymer concrete. And um, so we can uh, save uh, the land for disposal of fly ash. And we can uh, substantially reduce the CO2 uh, greenhouse gas emission. So. Um, uh, fly ash, a good thing is it's can, it can be served, used as a binder and to uh, to bind the uh, materials to make the uh, to replace cement to make the uh, concrete. And it uh, was first uh, first uh, suggested or proposed in 1970s, but uh, uh, intensive research on started by late uh, 1990 uh, year 2000. The many many research. Uh, being uh, conducted, but uh, the application is still quite limited. And the reason, and of course, I summarize a few, uh, probably a few reasons. Uh, one, many of them require heat curing. You cannot, you cannot be cured by uh, ambient conditions. Uh, normally, you're cured at a temperature of 70, 80 degrees. And on the construction side, of course, it's uh, difficult to heat curing. Uh, the uh, concrete, but if it's a prefabricate, prefabricated in the workshop, uh, it should be uh, okay. Or we can develop the material which we do not need heat curing, it's ambient curing. Uh, another uh, limitation is uh, geopolymer concrete is relatively brittle, even brittle 
than uh, cement concrete. And also, uh, many uh, researchers developed geopolymer concrete. They are material engineers. Uh, they do not, they just uh, work on the material properties, but they do not develop the design guides or qu quantify the mechanical properties. So those are some uh, reasons for its uh, limited application. So we try to uh, do some uh, improvement and we developed uh, one of my students, PhD students from Pakistan, uh, Musa Han. He uh, worked on, he finished last year. We developed uh, ambient cured geopolymer concrete. And that means we do not need uh, heat curing. And we can reach the uh, compressive strength about uh, 90 and possible. To overcome its brittleness, we put different types of fibers like uh, uh, shown here and this uh, um, and this uh, 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 spiral fiber and spiral fiber and uh, uh, cop uh, copper coated copper coated um, um, uh, steel fiber hooked end steel fiber or synthetic fiber. We did all different tests and such a pull out tests and the compression test or a split test and uh, and the the uh, a flexure test and also um, did the um, did the uh, triaxial test because we we're interested in the uh, uh, blast impact loading so we did the dynamic uh, triaxial test to try to get its complex mechanical properties such as equation of states, uh, damage surface, uh, and strength, uh, strength theory. Also did the dynamic test. Those are the split Hopkinson pressure bar test. Uh, just show you, this is the split uh, test. Uh, so the uh, uh, splitting damage. And this is uh, the uh, compression test by split Hopkinson pressure bar. Uh, to get the uh, the uh, dynamic material properties or dynamic uh, uh, strength increase factor, and we also work on as uh, I just mentioned, uh, the geopolymer concrete is a brittle, so that means uh, as the stress block we normally used in the design of concrete structure cannot be directly used, so we work on develop the stress block for engineers to use, and. So we uh, did uh, uh, testing and numerical de uh, uh, numerical simulation as well as uh, uh, the medical derivations based on the testing data. And we worked out the design stress block uh, with the fiber or without the fiber. Uh, so uh, we can uh, predict what is the load deflection curves and also the uh, <coughs> actual force bending moment uh, in interaction uh, Envelope as well. So uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, which uh, results which were facilitated uh, facilitate for the practical applications of geopolymer concrete in construction. And if we can have a wide application, then we surely will need a reduction on the greenhouse gas emission. And that means we will make our uh, civil engineering structures more sustainable. And multi hazard, uh, if you, you look at this, uh, those are the uh, uh, explosion, when, uh, earthquake and explosion. And in Wenchuan earthquake, Tianjin harbor explosion, and the Belgian gas explosion. And also uh, impact, as uh, a vehicle impact, uh, debris impact, and all ship impact on, or rock, rock impact on bridges. So uh, they have different response modes and also different uh, damage mechanism. And uh, that is uh, one reason, there are a few reasons, the cause of this one is, one reason is the strain rate effect. So under the static loading, strain rate is very, very low. We're talking about the 10 to the power minus six strain rate. And earthquake is about, uh, at most about one. And impact blast could be very high if it goes to uh, a contact uh, close in uh, explosion. The strain rate could be 10 to the power of 4 if you have a penetration 
uh, boolean penetration, the strain rate can go to uh, 10 to the power 5. Uh, so the strain rate uh, uh, will change the uh, structure, the material properties. Uh, so for example, this the reason it changes the material properties because I showed this one uh, and it had a different impact uh, speed, a uh, different loading uh, rate. The damage uh, uh, damage mode are different. Those you see at a very high, uh, very fast impact, this concrete specimen will be completely smashed. Smashed is uh, fragmentized. What you get is just ashes if you impact very fast. But if you apply a static node, what you get is just a very a predominant failure surface, shear failure or through uh, vertical cracks. So the damage modes are different. That's why the material properties you get will be different. And the second uh, uh, reason is the stress wave propagation. Uh, they giving you a very uh, a simple, uh, simply supported beam subject to uh, subject to uh, impact nodes. What you get you generate is a stress wave. Initially, you do not uh, basically you do not uh, necessarily have any reaction force at the support. And so uh, this stress wave propagate inside the structure will cause the damage to the structure instead of the general overall structure uh, deformation structure response. And the third reason is the inertia re uh, resistance or inertia effect. Give you this very simple example. You have a sample there subject to uh, say a uh, uniaxial compression or tension. And because the structure will deform uh, laterally due to Poisson's ratio effect, and this structure deformation, uh, because if on the on the static loading, no problem is just uh, deform laterally, and but the, on the, the very fast impact loading, uh, the deformation is very fast. That means you have a very big acceleration. This acceleration, according to Newton's second law, it will uh, basically uh, uh, induce uh, confinement will prevent this kind of deformation. Or the stress state on a static loading for such a simple structure, the stress state is uniaxial because you have uh, just a, a simple structure, you have uh, uh, actual loading. The stress is also uniaxial, but on the dynamic loading, the stress state will be very complex. It's a triaxial. That's why we need to always need to uh, more complex material properties if we work on the um, the impact and blast loading effects and we need equation of states we need uh, strength theory uh, etc and another thing is uh, response modes are different and the failure mechanism are different uh, I, I elaborate a little bit more if you look but you can see here a simply supported beam and the, the very close in blasting and basically you don't see uh, the uh, the uh, overall structure deformation and uh, the building that building is uh, on the left is the oklahoma uh, federal building the blasting you don't see much deformation although the building collapsed and uh, another on the right is the earthquake typical earthquake damage uh, so at uh, so this is earthquake damage and the earthquake uh, and, uh, excitation. We have we see much uh, very large uh, drifts of the floors, stories, and they have uh, uh, overall collapse of the structure. Uh, but uh, on the blast loading, what you see the structure collapse, and uh, you might have a collapse, partial collapse, progressive collapse, but structures basically stands vertically. Uh, you don't see uh, lateral drifts, and the same as uh, impact load, same as uh, uh, this uh, impact load. So those uh, this uh, uh, plots illustrate uh, this and earthquake loading and the earthquake loading. So um, what uh, uh, it excite the entire structure. So what you, what what you get the structure will respond like that. You have excessive story uh, drifts, and on the blast loading, it basically only cause uh, damage to the uh, cause damage to the um, 
uh, structure uh, at the say the uh, bottom floors and the trigger uh, because the loss of the vertical loading uh, uh, vertical loading uh, carrying uh, elements it will trigger progressive collapse and those are the and uh, no, 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 these are the um, uh, blasting on a simply support beam so very much depends on uh, how fast or how close the explosion blasting center is you might get a concrete crash spoiling you don't get any deformation or structure response it's just localized damage caused by stress wave or you can get is a direct shear or diagonal shear even only when the blast loading is uh, further away and that means uh, the loading rate is not that fast so we get the traditional what we see fracture government fracture type of uh, response and uh, or uh, equivalent of static loading type so and this is uh, uh, further illustrate this this is the testing we did um, uh, impact onto a structure uh, onto a column onto a column which is supported uh, supporting a big mass supporting a big mass so and uh, if you uh, uh, say uh, the deformation is when the impact first the uh, the because of huge mass because you have a huge mass um, uh, on top of there and uh, so you don't uh, you don't uh, this mass will generate a uh, large inertial resistance so the uh, the deformation of the structure actually is not uh, uh, like as under the static loading and uh, so it, if it's a static loading that is a type of uh, deformation because there's no restraints on top but on the dynamic loading on top it's equivalent to you have a large restraint because of the large uh, inertia resistance large inertia resistance so the uh, response modes are different and uh, similarly this is uh, uh, an impact test uh, we, uh, we did a drop weight test on a beam so it's like uh, this and if you look at this drop weight test we have a very detailed measurement what the what we have is uh, the this is the impact force the red red uh, curve uh, is impact force the blue uh, curve is the reaction force so when you upon the impact the reaction force actually is uh, in the same direction it's an active reaction force that means it's in the same direction of your impact nodes it's not resisting the impact actually it's uh, in the same direction of reaction node. And also, if you look at, at detail uh, in, uh, in a zoom in uh, view, they are uh, delayed. They are delayed. So upon the impact, you don't initially you don't have for a certain certain period. You don't have resistance. And when first resistance first occurs, and it's in the same direction as the impact force, it is inactive. So from uh, we need to have the equilibrium. How to balance this? Actually, it all come from the inertia because uh, Newton's second law, your impact is very fast and the acceleration is big. It's the inertia uh, res uh, is uh, resisting to balance the impact loading. Why we have, uh, besides uh, the reaction force, positive vertical reaction force, we get negative reaction force going down. Why? It's because what you have is upon impact what you have is the stress wave propagated inside the structure and it will reach it will reach the uh, on top of the support first so it actually generate generate uh, uh, an active reaction force that is a common observation uh, in the impact test so when you do the impact test you cannot use the load cell at the support to measure the load and they use this uh, to uh, to back calculate the what is the impact force which will give you wrong uh, wrong uh, uh, answers wrong uh, uh, measurement and so to explain this uh, we have this uh, dynamic equilibrium equation 
if you apply uh, impact force or dynamic loading, we have uh, three <coughs> type of resistors. First is the elastic resistors, basically it is a Hooke's law. And we have uh, uh, inertial resistors, that is the Newton's second law. And of course, if we include the damping, uh, we have uh, 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 the damping uh, force. All this from dynamic equilibrium is the uh, inertial force, damping force, and the elastic force will resist applied loads. But those, it very much depends on how fast the loading is applied. If we apply is a st static load, if we apply static load, then what we have is just basically is Hooke's law. If we apply, uh, there's, if there's low deformation, we apply a, a very fast dynamic load. What you have is balanced by the Newton's second law. Uh, so it very much depends on how fast your loading is applied. I uh, always like to show this example in Olympics. You uh, shoot the flying source, the disc, the flying source you throw into the air, you shoot it. If you uh, just imagine you put the air, uh, put the, uh, uh, your, di uh, your dining plate, and you hold it or you hold it in air, you push it no matter how, uh, you, how hard you push it, it just moves. It, you will ne never smash it, you will never break it. But uh, you shoot it by uh, bullet, it will break it. Uh, that is because um, you, would, you, you push it slowly, uh, basically you don't have inertia, uh, you don't have the MA uh, uh, part, inertia resistance, because acceleration is small. And uh, you will not damage it because you have no support in air, so you don't have elastic force, so there is no force inside this, uh, uh, it just moves, you push it in the, uh, this source. Uh, but if you, um, so it will, you cannot damage it, but if you shoot it, that means your loading is very, very fast, and you have a huge acceleration generated. So you have the stress wave into the plate, into this flying source, they will smash it. So the damage mode are, are different, and so, uh, those are some. Uh, I look at the time. I don't have much time. I uh, will not talk about this. Uh, basically, uh, uh, basically, we can uh, do a very uh, simple uh, revision. Uh, basically, when you uh, load is the first apply, and uh, that is this is loading. This is the deformation. When load is applied very quickly, and so you do not have uh, much deformation. So that means elastic, because the V is very small, no deformation, that means the elastic resistance is very small. So the structure is balanced by inertial force. So in that case, uh, um, but if you took, look at the earthquake, it's a completely different. I speed it up, and this is a typical earthquake uh, uh, energy or uh, free spectrum. Uh, earthquake ground motion has its most energy distributed in a range of say 0 0.1 hertz to 20 hertz. So that falls into the fundamental or low vibration modes. If you have a very stiff, short structure, the first mode will be primarily excited. And because that is excitation, that is energy uh, distributed. If you have a tall, uh, slender, uh, flexible structure, probably a first few modes would be excited. So because of this excitation, that, uh, that is earthquake loading. And it, so the, uh, you see the notch deformation, notch uh, interstory drifts. That is a typical response uh, uh, modes of earthquake or damage um, modes. It, but uh, uh, so that's why uh, people use in earthquake design or use, for example, interstory drifts in Australia design codes, use 1.5%. And in Xi'an uh, codes, it is a structure engineer association of uh, California. They use 2.5% uh, drift codes. Uh, so that is a very, very good criteria to assess the uh, performance, assess, uh, to uh, assess the damage of the structure subject to earthquake excitation, earthquake loading. So also to mitigate this damage, those earthquake, uh, typical earthquake damage, and we put the cross uh, brace uh, uh, put a bracing cross brace uh, into it 
it's very very effective. But you look at the, the blast, you look at the blast, they uh, they are very uh, different. And a blast loading uh, actually has the largest blast loading uh, at the bottom of the ground if the uh, explosion occurs at the ground surface. And then in in that the, in that case, uh, you see the deformation. You don't see the drifts. Why you don't see the drifts? Uh, you only see the uh, column uh, deformation. You don't see much drifts because each floor is has a concentrated mass. The mass is huge. The mass compared to the column is huge at the floor level. So this big mass will provide a large inertial resistance. So what you have that its deformation damage is that a column. So you lost one column, a bottom column, for example, then will trigger progressive collapse. That is how the uh, damage in blast uh, loading. That is uh, uh, explains why this, although it partially collapsed, but it still stands it almost uh, vertically. You don't see uh, any drifts. So uh, by looking at this, so if you use the drifts as a criteria, to assess the blast effect on building structures, it would be uh, incorrect. Incorrect. There are some uh, people, some uh, research papers, they use that. That uh, not makes no sense. And also, <coughs> some researchers try to use the breeze, cross breeze, to uh, strengthen the structure to resist blast loading. That is not effective either because you don't see the drifts. Uh, it works for earthquake, but not does not work for this uh, structure against blast loading. And uh, there are some, even some uh, people try to say to do the control, uh, structure uh, control. We do, we can control the vibration on the wind or sea wave, um, or wave loading, but not blast loading because it's not possible uh, to control because uh, we're talking about in the uh, uh, duration, loading duration in order of a millisecond is just, uh, uh, it's very, very fast. You cannot have any uh, mechanical system can react uh, that fast to generate a reasonable force to control the deformation. Uh, so uh, to, uh, to summarize this uh, earthquake uh, blast impact loading effect, um, so we have, let's say, the drifts. Uh, uh, it works fine, it's a good criteria for earthquake, but it does not uh, work for a uh, bl uh, blast impact. And and the structure and uh, mass, you add in the mass were beneficial to resist blast impact loads and make it heavier, but it will not uh, be beneficial to resist earthquake. In earthquake design, we try to make the structure as light as possible because uh, structure mass will attract a uh, uh, squeak force. And so uh, in that imposed a challenge for us to do the multi-hazard analysis and design. But good thing is we increase the strength, increase the ductility and the energy absorption capabilities is always uh, beneficial, is always beneficial. Um, so, uh, uh, now I, I give some example, quickly give some example on the uh, prefabrication. And I notice uh, I'm a little bit slow. Uh, so we worked on the precast uh, segmental column. Uh, precast segmental column, of course, uh, has been used in uh, thousands of years. And uh, in uh, Greece, in Asia, and that is in Angkor Wat, in Cambodia. And they just uh, stack the rocks, uh, the stones, and so make a columns after a thousand years still uh, standing, survive. But now we can make it even uh, increase its stability, make it stronger. We use that because we can put post-tension, post-tension uh, post uh, force to en enhance the stability. And it has been used, for example, I quite uh, used uh, in many uh, constructions. For example, the Hong Kong, Macau, uh, too high uh, uh, bridge. Uh, in China and all U.S. elevated uh, bridge in Texas. But all this basically is uh, 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 basically uh, uh, what works in the uh, non-seismicity areas. In seismic areas, uh, it's not uh, being used yet. Um, so a lot of uh, research 
uh, people do research to uh, to check its uh, seismic uh, uh, capabilities. And we probably is the only group in the world who also work on its blast and impact resistance. So to check its uh, resistance, we did a seismic uh, capability. We did the uh, cyclic testing and to find out its uh, hysteretic curves. We actually tested about 60, 60 uh, scaled columns with different types of designs. I'm not uh, going into details. Uh, for example, here put a different number of segments uh, with uh, FRP uh, wrap. Uh, with FRP wrap, I also put external uh, energy dissipation plates uh, because uh, you don't uh, it's a segment, the, this uh, block, uh, this uh, segment just open on the tension. That means you don't get concrete tensile damage. So it's the uh, energy absorption capability will be small. Um, so, but the good thing is it has uh, less residual deformation. Less, uh, and we also developed a numerical model and did uh, the numerical simulations. We used different type, different type of uh, uh, ED bus, use mouth steel, uh, uh, ship memory annoy, and and so and did a shake table test. I quickly show and this is the shake table we have in cutting. We have four check tables. We can put them together and uh, form a one. It's very well controlled. As a big check table, we can put the four at different locations. And we can test pipelines and the bridges. And so these are the uh, check table the, uh, testing. We use uh, the uh, uh, Imperial Valley uh, as recorded earthquake. It just gradually increased. So. To verify, we actually test a lot more, but I uh, just uh, uh, put here. So we have a reference reinforced concrete column uh, with steel reinforcement, steel tendon. We have, say, a geopolymer concrete and uh, use uh, uh, FRP. We use uh, FRP reinforcement and FRP tendon. FRP is another uh, material we work on because it's a caution resistant. It can uh, 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 avoid corrosion of steel, then that means we can uh, reduce the maintenance uh, cost. So those are the uh, some uh, testing. Uh, that is the uh, column with normal concrete and the segments with steel tendons. And uh, it uh, failed at the open 9G. Make it uh, 0 0.8 G, 0 0.9 G, it will collapse at 0 0.9 G. So that is uh, uh, another column, and uh, it that is made of. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, that is the previous one. That, that is a, a new one. And that is made of uh, geopolymer concrete with FRP. Um, so uh, you look, their performance are uh, uh, quite uh, similar on the 0 0.6 G excitations. Um, so uh, because of time, uh, I, I go faster. So we compare, say uh, both of them have failed collapsed at 0 0.9 G ground excitation with PGA, and the performance are comparable. So we can, uh, based on this testing, we can see we can use uh, uh, geopolymer concrete based on FRP tendons to replace the ordinary Portland cement concrete with steel tendons because they have uh, shoot a similar performance to resist a quick loading. Of course, we also built this model, numerical model to calculate the structural response. And because of timing, I quickly uh, do. And the second the loading is impact, uh, the uh, vehicle impact on the bridge. We did the testing in the lab and uh, uh, calibrate numerical model and did the numerical simulations. And so this is vehicle impact. I did to, to quickly we have a, build three uh, vehicle models. One is a Chevron pickup, a medium truck, and also a trailer, a big truck trailers, subject to impact and also propose a design impact force and improvement to the actual uh, force, uh, EU uh, force, and also China's design uh, force for the vehicle impact. And so, uh, just quickly 
So um, on top is the uh, uh, this uh, mono, uh, mononisic mononisic uh, uh, columns, and on top is the segmented uh, columns. You see, under the vehicle impact and the mononisic column, if the impact loading is a lot, uh, the damage actually spread uh, throughout the entire column. That is what we observe in the field. And but for segmented column, the damage because it's uh, discontinuous, we have a different segment. So the damage is uh, many, um, many are uh, limited at the bottom, at the bottom. And so those are the uh, comparison with the actual the impact damage of the columns. So we did uh, the improvement, can use FRP to uh, wrap it, use a different shear keys, and also based on testing and numerical simulation. Another thing is uh, blasting. Uh, that is a recent event. A collision on a highway in Italy caused an extraordinary blast that killed at least two people and left at least 70 others injured. It happened near the city of Bologna. Police say a tanker truck carrying liquefied petroleum gas was involved in a traffic accident. The initial collision caused a fire, but shortly after, the entire truck exploded sending flames across all lanes of the highway and into the air. It happened on a raised part of the highway, and flames spread to a parking lot below, which caused some cars to explode. The blast created a crater in the road and also caused a nearby bridge to partially collapse. So, um, um, it's no time, uh, quickly. This actually occurred two years ago, and if you check the Google or uh, pay attention, and occurs every year around the world. And if this is a very small uh, tanker. It's not a big tanker we can normally see on the highway. It's a small tanker, but of course, a huge damage. It's a Bolivia, a Bolivia explosion. We did the simulation. We tried to uh, replicate this. And, and this a Bolivia explosion. And you see the, um, at the very close to the explosion center, and uh, we predicted, uh, estimated the uh, the uh, pressure, plus pressure is about five bar. That means about 500 k kPa. That why that is why it uh, caused a collapse. Uh, very uh, uh, far away, uh, far away. It's uh, um, uh, on the buildings. It can reach about 0 0.1 bar. That means about 10 kPa. So you are damaged, will not damage the building, but it will of course smash the windows, and so. Uh, we also uh, did a simulation on the blast loading on the possible uh, say segmented uh, segmented uh, columns, and uh, with uh, all with uh, with, uh, with uh, strengthening use the steel uh, sleeves, FRPs, and uh, 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 so on. Uh, try to simulate uh, the uh, blasting uh, effects uh, on the blast. How to we can protect so. Uh, because of timing, I cannot uh, talk about in details, but uh, I uh, su summarize. So, in, <clears throat> to conclude my uh, presentation, so uh, we uh, actually, as uh, engineers, uh, we have uh, 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 the challenge, now we face uh, the challenge to develop the resilient, we need to consider resilient, we need to consider the sustainability of our structures to meet the requirement of the society. So it, that is a challenge. Um, but uh, the good thing is because uh, the, uh, many, uh, we have many, many opportunities, especially advancement in other professions. For example, computer technology, material science, manufacturing technology. That opened the doors for us to develop new designs, new constructions. And that, uh, of course, uh, to uh, grab these opportunities we need uh, to our own research and to how we can adapt these new technologies into civil engineering. So in this presentation, uh, and I just uh, uh, present very uh, quickly and not in uh, any depth of any uh, specific research project, but very quickly my uh, some of our uh, recent and current research project and amending my thoughts and uh, what we could uh, do, what we can uh, improve 
to meet the society uh, need to make ge next generation uh, designs uh, to take into consideration of sustainability, resilient, and also multiple hazard resistance. So, and with that, uh, I, I, I thank you uh, for your patience, for your listening, and also thank again, Professor Rafik and uh, Professor Bakary for organizing this. Uh, sorry, I do not have time to talk in detail. I'm a little bit too aggressive, prepared too much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay Professor Hao, thank you so much. So I, think, I think it has been so long not hearing from you. So uh, for the information of everyone, Professor Hao was my PhD supervisor when I was in the University of Western Australia. And then I can just notice that Professor Hao now is moving to another topic of the uh, study, which is more to uh, more to uh, material, I think. So uh, well, it, seems, it, it makes me feel that I'd like to do another PhD then. All right, so uh, I would like to proceed for another session of que uh, question and answer. So uh, while waiting for, okay, now we can see that in the screen that we have one question. So the first question is that uh, between resilience and safety, which one should company choose in cost benefit analysis? Um, I, I think uh, resilience uh, covers uh, safety and safety is the uh, utmost important uh, because we cannot afford to have our uh, civil infrastructure collapse. And, but uh, to make it uh, resilient, of course, we need to consider safety. That is one component. Um, but we need to also uh, take into consideration how, uh, what is the acceptance uh, the society will accept if a certain level of damage occurs, how, uh, what is the disruption say one week, one month, can we accept in a, for a structure for a city? So um, I, safety is most important, and but resilient means uh, you broaden your analysis, make it wider, and but what cost should cover the safety. All right, thank you, Prof. So I have another mm -hmm. one. So in the structural health monitoring field, many researchers have applied various machine learning tools to perform damage identification and monitoring in different structure. I would like to ask Professor Hong Hao that what will be the future research trend, what tools will be used after the machine learning in his vision? Um, we uh, actually, uh, we're still working on <laughs> structure health monitoring. And my uh, our current uh, focus uh, basically is in two areas. One is how to collect the data. We now we use uh, instead of use traditional sensors, we use a camera, and even fly a UAV uh, to collect the data. And the second is how to make the the structure health monitoring uh, accept, uh, make the society or engineer to actually accept this structure health monitoring. Structure health monitoring one thing. Uh, we can get some uh, data to, uh, I mean, realistic data. But the, uh, the challenge is uh, how sensitive this monitoring uh, methodology is. We can uh, get to the uh, minor structure damage. So there are so many uh, structure house monitoring data there, and but uh, not many successful uh, damage identification stories. That is why a lot of people do not, still do not accept, although they find it's very, very important. So in uh, put this into the picture, I think machine learning maybe is the one uh, possibility uh, because uh, machine learning, that means uh, you train your data, make it uh, find this hidden and nonlinear relations between the structure condition with uh, the measurement uh, response. And but is the make a machine learning uh, also sensitive to minor damage, make it uh, um, reliable. Uh, you need a lot of data to train, to make, to train the, uh, uh, the to train the uh, model, uh, the neural network model, uh, deep learning network model. And that is still a challenge because we don't have that many data. So when we train the model, we're still based on the numerical simulations, basically, so far. 
Uh, but I believe uh, there are many, many challenges. I personally uh, think if we have the opportunity, uh, all the important structures should be monitored. All right, Professor, we have the final one. Is resilience of uh, structure already embedded in current code of practice for design of structure and building materials or engineers should refer to other reference? Thank you. Um, I don't uh, think so. And there are many, many uh, talk. It's a very hot topic uh, because uh, that's why I said it's a yin word. And, uh, but the, there are quite a few misunderstandings. Uh, there is no framework. That's why I spent some time uh, to define its uh, meaning. And I just uh, received some uh, question there uh, as, uh, uh, from ASE, American Society of Civil Engineers, last week. And they asked uh, me to put some input. Uh, should they, um, uh, ASE, implement or should the, the civil engineering uh, area should implement, say, the certificate? and sustainable resilient uh, uh, certificate for engineers uh, apart from the professional engineer registration. So whether it's a diploma, a certificate or re registration is required in the future. So that is that means uh, uh, people out there also thinking about this implement possible implementation, but uh, there is I don't know any country has already implemented yet. Okay, Prof. that was the final question. And then I would like to express my appreciation to you to join us and then agreed uh, to become one of our guest uh, speaker here. And then I also would like to express my appreciation to the audience. And then before I uh, we finish the session, I would like to pass again the session to our dean. Uh, okay, Prof. Over to you, Prof. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prof Hisham, for sharing this session. And to Prof Hong Hao, uh, I mean, you know, you have shared a lot. There is a lot there that you shared to the audience, to all of us. I really cannot say thank you. You know, there's a, a lot of stuff that we learned today uh, regarding your field of expertise. And as uh, Prof Hisham mentioned just now, our School of Civil Engineering is the top school of civil engineering in Malaysia. So we have, uh, you know, hundreds of institutions of higher learning in Malaysia and UTM is number one for civil engineering. And we are very proud to have Prof Hisham under your supervision. Prof Hisham mentioned just now that uh, you were his uh, PhD uh, uh, supervisor. Yeah. So uh, perhaps that's the reason why uh, our School of Civil Engineering became number one, uh, the top <laughs> School for uh, Civil Engineering in Malaysia. So again, thank you so much, Professor Hong Hao. It is uh, certainly an honor to have you in our program. And to all of you uh, all around the globe watching this webinar, UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so very much for watching. Until, uh, until then, uh, we will have uh, further more Distinguished Lecture Series uh, for you in the future. Until then, bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rafik.